Welcome to Feminist Journalism Now, um, which at one point was also called Doing Feminist Journalism Now, and there were a couple of other titles that we were thinking about as we put together this program. Tonight is part of the Applebaum Publishers and Editors series, which is a, an event series at the Kelly Writers House devoted to um, inviting publishers and editors to this space for conversations about the business and art of publishing. And we're especially excited to welcome back Anna Holmes, who was here um, three years ago, I believe, to mm -hmm. talk about her path through journalism. Um, I will introduce her and the rest of our panelists in a moment. But I'm Julia Black. I'm the director of the Creative Writing Program. Um, and one of the things we do in the creative writing program is we offer a journalistic <laughs> writing minor. And of course, there are all sorts of other journalism related things happening here at Penn and at the Kelly Writers House. So if some of what you hear tonight piques your interest, um, please get in touch with us about how to get more involved with either the courses that we offer here or any number of different programs that happen at the Writers House devoted to journalism, including um, lunchtime conversations with journalists like these folks, um, internship programs, um, mentorship programs available through the university, um, and lots of great stuff. So um, we're going to have a conversation tonight. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we were thinking originally that Salamisha and Anna would, would kick us off with a few remarks. Um, and Rebecca and Taylor, sorry, I'm saying their names without introducing them, which I will do in a moment, um, would, would then sort of jump in with some questions and comments. And then we're going to open up the conversation to all of you. So we're hoping to have um, a very lively conversation with everyone who's in the room at this moment. So I'll first introduce Anna Holmes. Anna has uh, written and edited for numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Newsweek, InStyle, and the New Yorker Online. She is the founder of the iconic feminist website Jezebel.com and the 2012 recipient of a Mirror Award for Best Commentary. Um, I really love this fact. In 2013, her Twitter account was named one of the top 140 Twitter feeds by Time Magazine. And I, <laughs> I seem to recall that on your website, you say something like, when that happened, you then retreated and had to regroup because that's a lot of exposure. She's the editor of two books, including the Book of Jezebel, which um, we have copies of actually outside the, um, the Arts Cafe for, for sale tonight. And she works as a columnist for the New York Times Book Review and as senior vice president at First Look Media's film, TV, and digital studio. Salamisha Tillett is an associate professor of English and Africana Studies at, here at Penn and a faculty member of the Alice Paul Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. She's appeared on the BBC, CNN, NMS, MSNBC, NPR, TEDx Women, and has written blogs and editorials for The Atlantic, The Chicago Tribune, The Guardian, The Nation, The New York Times, The Root, and Time, and she is the co-founder of A Long Walk Home, which is a nonprofit organization that uses art to end violence against, <clears throat> against girls and women. Taylor Hosking, to my left, is an urban studies and political science student here at Penn, whose academic interest in the interdisciplinary study of urban inequality has become a focus of her journalism. She's written for the Philadelphia Inquirer via a real arts internship and for Philly Mag and an investigative article that she wrote for Impact Magazine, which is a magazine here on campus, won Best Analysis Article of the 2014-2015 school year from Penn's Publication Cooperative. And Rebecca Tan, at the other end of the table, is an English and creative writing student here at Penn, where she works as a beat and senior reporter at the DP, covering gender and diversity. She has also written and researched for Singapore's leading gender equality advocacy group, AWARE, and has written for Impact Magazine, Vulture, and The Straits Times. So welcome. Welcome to our panel. Welcome to Feminist Journalism Now. <laughs> um, so Salamisha, I'd like to invite you to maybe just offer a few introductory remarks. What, what, is, what does the title of our panel mean to you in this moment in February 2017? Um, maybe what are two or three pressing concerns for you um, as someone who circulates in a lot of different fields, including including journalism, you're, you're a frequent commentator and sort of a public intellectual thinking about gender, race, intersectionality. Yeah, I guess right. thank you all for being here and thank you for traveling mm -hmm. and being here as well. Um, yeah, like so the term, so I'll just say like bio, autobiographically, the term journalist 
is both familiar and foreign to me. So I, when I was an undergrad, when I was in high school, I wrote for the school newspaper. When I was at Penn, I wrote for the feminist newspaper. Back then, it was called like Generation XX, thus I'm Generation X. Um, and then the Vision, which was the black student newspaper on campus. So I never wrote for the DP, but I always thought like maybe I should, and I had this kind of tension between like the kind of independent newspapers on campus that were more politically explicit and the DP. So I always had that tension. I went to graduate school. I was like, should I leave and go get up my um, uh, degree in um, journalism. So I always had that kind of tension as part of my identity, but it really was the explosion of like the blogosphere and, and particularly the formation of like the rude and certain um, kind of online sites committed to or dedicated to like black life and black politics that I began publicly writing again. And partly because I had this book on Nina Simone that is still percolating that I wanted it to be a trade book. So I had to really reinvent myself as a writer I have an academic identity and I have an academic book and I've been writing in grad school and as a junior faculty member here, publishing in that language and that tradition. Um, but I, since I wanted this book to be a trade book, I knew I had to reinvent my identity as a writer. And that was a very difficult process in some ways, but also very expansive and um, important. So, so my coming to journalism, which is still like a weird thing when like people inter introduce me as a journalist, I'm like, I'm like a cultural critic or I'm, I'm something else. Um, but I, now I think I can claim at least not the training of a journalist, but at least creating a space in which I'm doing that kind of work in the public. So I guess that's, that's kind of my own trajectory, which is a little different than <coughs> your trajectory or anyone else's trajectory on this panel since it's a bit circuitous um, and a little bit un um, unexpected in some ways, and yet deeply planned. So, <laughs> so I was like, I want to, you know. So, so yeah. So that's kind of. But in this era, I think the voices of um, feminist, feminist of color, people who are thinking about multiple forms of oppression at the same time, I think, who have been doing this work for so long, um, but also that kind of lens or that prism, I think, is really important. Um, and necessary more than ever. Um, whether those voices will be elevated quite as um, often as they should be, I think you know is going to be interesting to see. Like, are they? Because we still have these disparities in most mainstream publications and media outlets. So I'll just say that. But I do think uh, this work has been done for a long time. It continues to be necessary. But I think the moment is ripe for much more rigor in terms of our voices being included and in shaping conversations and discourse. So what I, what I really love about what you just said is you, you're citing a, a need for a kind of rigor, not just in um, kind of access to channels and who gets to speak, but also I imagine a rigor to what gets spoken um, and kind of the quality of that speech. Um, yeah, that's just me. <laughs> I don't think everyone, yeah, I mean, it's a kind of arbitrary category too, like what is rigor in terms of, I think I'm bringing that, that attentiveness to the complexity of the ideas said beautifully and simply to me is rigor. So mm -hmm. Anna, does that notion of rigor resonate for you at all? Well, I, I want to answer the first question that you asked her, because I was thinking, well, when you told me that the name of the event was about feminist journalism, I kind of winced a little bit, not because I have a problem with the word feminist, but because, yeah, my definition of journalism is very specific, and it's not um, something that I, I don't use it to describe myself right now, I, maybe in the past I have. Um, and, and I wouldn't use it to describe a lot of what I have personally written over the past 10 years, I would say it was more commentary. Like journalism to me is um, the act of reporting out a story and, and, and um, then writing it, or just reporting it. There are plenty of pieces, newspaper pieces that are reported by a group of people and you know coalesced together by one writer and then published that way. So, um, it, so I, 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 you know, the, the idea of feminist journalism. It's interesting because I think that there's, I think there's less feminist journalism than there is feminist commentary um, and criticism out there. I think that, um, I can think of a few people I might define as being feminist journalists. One, one of whom is someone that both Salmisha and I know, Rebecca Traster, who works for New York Magazine. Um, although she sometimes infuses her pieces with. With commentary, she is often reporting um, and doing interviews and doing like that hard legwork that that is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a lot harder than sitting back, you know, on my couch and like having thoughts that then come out onto a 
onto a computer screen, which isn't to say that that's easy either. But um, so there is a rigor to the idea of journalism, I think, that doesn't necessarily is, exist as explicitly with commentary. So I don't know if there's been a rise, and this wasn't your question, in, in feminist journalism, but I certainly think there's been a mainstreaming of feminist commentary. Um, and, and by that, I don't just mean issues with regards to gender politics, but also racial politics and sexual politics. There's been a mainstreaming of that over the past seven to 10 years, where what you tended to see at first were a lot of these discussions happening on um, the internet. And then the, a lot of the women or, pe or writers who were, who were talking about these issues being um, recruited by mainstream news organizations to, to have their voices heard there. So that's very... Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think I could have guessed 10 years ago that so many, so many women and women of color that I know who wrote on their personal blogs or on small for-profit blogs about race or gender would then be writing you know, feature articles in Elle magazine or um, that the New York Times would be hiring for a, a gender editor. I'm not sure what that means still, and I don't think they've hired that person, but it, it, it does feel like there was a change in the mainstream media in response to um, digital media. And you know, you, you basically just said as much, that like, that, was, that was kind of your... Mm -hmm. Uh, that was what allowed you to pivot from purely academic writing to more, um, I don't think commercial is the right word, but... Um, I say public. Pu yeah, public publicly, publicly facing. Um, so Rebecca Traster is one example of someone who's doing feminist journalism, mm -hmm. of, the, of some of the folks who have entered the public, maybe from doing blogging. Are, are there some names that come to mind immediately for, for either of you? Feminist journalists, journalists of color who are reaching a wider audience because of that turn that's made available to them? Because of that turn? Well, I, I, think, I think the distinction, I don't think the journalists were coming through the blogs. I think the cultural critics or the mm -hmm. commentators, yeah. or I think the journalists were, I don't know, I'm like beat report, you know, doing the, like the, going through the, the institutions in which, you know, journalists were kind of supposed to go through, I think. Um, would yeah, you say that? I mean, there was, there was a woman who worked for me um, named Erin Carmon, who was, when I, when I hired her, was a media reporter for Women's Wear Daily. Um, and then I hired her, and then she was kind of given free reign to do the sort of reporting on stories she wanted to do. But she was also blogging, which is to say she was also yeah. reading something and then recontextualizing it and spitting it out you know, within an hour and a half and putting it up on a website. But the, the longer kind of stuff that she did did allow her to um, create a, a space for herself in, specifically around politics and specifically around reproductive rights. That, And I think she's one of the most probably well-known and talented reporters on reproductive rights that exists in the United States today. And she definitely has a point of view. Like she's definitely pro-choice, and uh, she she doesn't try to hide that. But um, so I would describe I would describe her as someone who pivoted from being a reporter of of, of one type or in, in one genre or one type of subject to another. Um, you know, a lot of the women that I worked with when I ran the site went on to bigger and better things, and they still work in that space. And there's plenty of like women that we that I knew of who had personal blogs and now write for Cosmopolitan which is strange because Cosmopolitan used to be very much everything that feminists were against, <laughs> at least it felt like. Um, so you want me to like list off names? Or? No, okay. I, oh, <laughs> I have to. I also <laughs> have a comment about that. Later. Yes, Taylor um, has a comment. Yeah, I found it to be really interesting the way that like GQ and Teen Vogue and these like places that I wouldn't associate with like intense like intersectional feminist criticism mm -hmm. to be like running campaigns, like one of... Um, my good friend, who probably you guys know, Rashad, was in like um, an Equinox um, commercial where they're trying to tie like his struggles with his like um, speech impediment to this idea of like committing to something. So like go to the gym, um, and it's just real. Not to belittle that campaign, it was like a beautiful commercial. But um, I think that marketing companies are also. Um, becoming aware of this shift um, where people like want to feel as though like whatever they're buying into has a deeper meaning um, and also like whether it's just like the hair products you're getting um, 
it's going to like be a part of something that you like believe in um, and this sort of like political moment that we're in. So I think that's interesting and like definitely creates um, waves for people who are more politically minded, like myself who've written for very like traditional um, news politics um, outlets. Um, I'm talking to people like, where should I mm -hmm. work next year? They're like, apply to Teen Vogue. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but yeah, they're being serious. Yeah, it, the, the, like the commodification of like gender politics makes me uncomfortable. Well, earlier you called it mainstreaming. So is there diff a difference well, between no, mainstreaming no, no. and commodification? Well, when I'm talking about commodification, I'm talking about like for-profit corporations or consumer companies, not media organizations. Although the New York Times is a for-profit entity, right? But um, that is a, that's an important distinction, you would say. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when I talk about mainstreaming, I'm talking about the mainstreaming of feminist, um, anti-racist writers into um, mainstream publications that they had no access to previously because they were female or people of color or both. And you know they didn't fit the background that um, was, was and still is so often celebrated, of, you know, white guys um, running things. But the, the commodification is, is, is like the, the selling of products and using advertising of the, the you go girl type advertising or, or even um, the cynical use of the gender politics to, like Ivanka Trump did during the campaign, you know, um, the, it makes me a bit uncomfortable. It's like it, it's like it. <laughs> there was something happening in the culture that then crested in such a way that um, it became trendy to talk about, well, but but not to talk about gender politics, but talk about feminism in the most surface level way. I think I called it. I think once I said to somebody it was like skim milk. Feminism. <laughs> um, so that makes me uncomfortable when and I see that, that. Is that one of the things that, so we're starting to, I think, articulate a difference between journalism and commentary or reporting mm -hmm. and commentary. Mm -hmm. So is that one of the things that that commentators get to choose to to challenge and to complicate uh, when they're writing for for a public audience? Is, is, is what is commodification the, of things like like, like do they are they are they challenging it? Or is, is that, that one of the choices that say say those of us at the table. I think more of them should challenge it than than and are doing so. Like it's almost like there's a I don't know, I sound so horrible and like cynical to be like complaining. I'm, I'm not complaining about Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue is great, but it's just it's been like Teen Vogue is Teen Vogue is following like the the work that a lot of people did online as are many other women's magazines um in a way that feels a little bit cynical to me. Maybe not so much Teen Vogue, but even like Glamour, the way the Cosmo got remade. Um it's good that they were ushered into the 21st century, but um, I don't know, there's just something about the fact is that they're still selling clothes and makeup, um, ultimately. I mean, like that, that's who advertises in those magazines. So there's just something that always made me a little uncomfortable about it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm <laughs> articulating my, my point very well, but I, I, I think it's part of the reason why after I left Jezebel and someone said, why don't you start another site like it? Um, I was like, no, I don't, I don't, I, I did that. I don't, I also, I felt that there was, it, it made me uncomfortable. The idea of, it felt like I'd be profiting off something that was happening that I didn't feel entirely comfortable with. So Rebecca, what do you, you yeah, like I was just you have gonna, a thought? Yeah, I, I was just going to agree. Like I agree with a lot of what she said about the commodification of gender politics today, but, um, you know, a lot of news agencies, even the DP, uh, because of the transformation to digital media, that's the, the biggest currency and only thing that really matters are page views, page views, page views. Um, and um, and I think even in working in a within a newspaper like the New York Times or or the Wall Street Journal, there are particularly hot button issues or clickbaity titles or issues that are going to draw readers. And even within this, there is a sense of commodification or a sense of choosing areas within gender politics that are more trendy or more interesting um, to talk about. And I think that this sort of like changes the way that um, people en masse or like the general public interacts and relates to feminism, which I think can be problematic for the future. And I think as, a, as someone hoping to enter the industry in the future, it's certainly something that I worry about. And I wonder how news agencies are going to deal with this. So you're worrying about um, how to enter a profession in which the changing of the platform is changing how we are experiencing things like feminist writing, feminist commentary. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, 
I think it's definitely great that more people are, are exposed to it, but the way in which it's being exposed to people, it's, it's a very narrow focus on particular, particular hot button issues, which certainly are important, but leave out others. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember, like, and this is, I mean, I have the luxury of obviously having a full-time job in the academy, so in some ways, my entry point to blogging was one of, like, reinvention versus, like, uh, necessity or, or depending on that as my income. But I remember the moment, so to get into that space, I felt like I was, I think my first piece must have been like on, well, I, I wrote this piece for a site that I don't know, called Black Prof, that, that Mark Lamont Hill, he mm -hmm. curated, this seems like forever ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a piece on like, Melissa Harris Perry and Gloria Steinem and the whole debate mm -hmm. and, and it, you know, and they're both are quite responsive to, to the thing. But then my first piece for The Root was on um, like missing Dave Chappelle and like why black comedian, like why um, the lack of, no one could get Obama, like SNL, no one, and like, and, and so it was cultural criticism, but in those early years, I was like really responding to whatever was, to get my footing and to get my voice, responding to whatever was going on, like just, and like, I remember making a decision that's like very exhausting to do, but also um, I wanted to kind of shift my focus and kind of merge my identity as like a real cultural critic. I was doing that, but I still was driven by like, not clickbait, but like what's hot, like what, you know, responding to a, a disagreement that's happening in the public sphere or, you know, you know, years ago I probably would have written about the Grammys and Beyonce and now, you know, so, but that's, I don't have to do that, but also I'm not interested in doing, I mean, other people are doing really good work. But that drive to have your stuff read to get attention to become a figure or a writer that's recognized is real. So how does one negotiate that And if you want to do different types of pieces or pieces that you think are maybe more nuanced but don't necessarily like, um, aren't as you know, clickbait friendly in the, in the title. So that shift was important to me, but it was also one I was very conscious of making. And, I don't know. I think it's it's the era that we're in, but you can still do like interesting and complicated pieces in the short form. But I think, and not to say those aren't interesting and complicated, but sometimes you may be having to be reactive as opposed to driving yeah. the conversation or shaping cultural attitudes. And I didn't want to be as responsive or I just didn't think I was the best use of my my skill set or my insight. So yeah, I feel like a lot of react pieces that are essentially reactions to things in the culture or the news are have a shelf life of like 24 hours if that and and you know there are also 100 other people who are doing the same thing and maybe you do it better than they do but but it it, it feels like it increasingly uh not not a waste of time i think it's actually good training to have to figure out how to write very quickly and have to synthesize your opinions in a way but i i don't think that it's a you you, you can't last you can't do that as a career, like for forever. It's just it's just too exhausting, and also there's too much competition. And and I think ultimately the things that I'm most proud of that I've written um, were not things that I tossed off in three hours in response to something that happened in the culture. They usually they may have been things that were in response to something that happened in the culture, but I took days or weeks to try and figure out how I felt. And sometimes I was very much informed by other people's quick responses, like, and I would try and weave those in. But I don't think that that was the best thing. The, the, the weird thing about, well, it's not weird, but the, what, what's interesting to me is that if, you know, 15 years ago, there were, if, if you were a young woman who wanted to get into um, media, journalism, and, and write about gender politics, and do it at a, at a fairly, um, you know, well-known publication, there was nowhere for you to do that. I mean, there just, there just wasn't. Um, so the avenues have increased, but sure. but I, but I, but I also what I also well, what I worry about, and this is the case with some young writers of color as well, is that then that, that, that then they get pigeonholed by their editors. They're like, oh, I'm going to hire this young African American writer, and he only can he he's going to be only tasked with writing about things that you know affect black people or about black people, um, as opposed to just being given the 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 range to show all of his skills and interests and and and, um, and and that worries me because I do see that at mainstream publications where certain women are tasked with writing about gender and certain people of color are tasked with writing about race to the point where I think that they are being held back from um, truly expressing themselves in all the other ways that, that they can and all their uh, other interests. Right. Um, and that's actually a restricting of avenues, not an expansion of them. Yeah, right? or, or, you know, or you know, I have so many friends who are like the lone person of color on whatever... You know, staff of some magazine or website, and you know the the minute something that has to do with race comes up, 
they get approached, even if they don't really have any facility in, in talking about race in that context. Like if it's about how there's no um, people of color being hired at the highest levels of the State Department and the person is a cultural critic of pop culture, you know, they're being asked to write about that anyway because they have, they have to have an opinion because they're, you know, so I think it's, I, I think it can become very limiting for people as much as the industry has become more open, if that makes sense. Because again, coming through it this other way, like so, there was this piece the Times did on um, uh, girl girls, like mm -hmm. a roundup of critics, and so I was approached to write about um, like she, she didn't know if I watched girls, so I was like, yeah, I watched all six seasons of girls, and then she was like, well, do you have any thoughts? And da da da, and I was like, yeah, like I knew that other their staff writers probably didn't want to write about race and mm -hmm. gender and girls, but I'd written a piece when it first came out on The Nation. So I didn't feel uncomfortable being that person because like in my other world, like I, I think I'm actually really good about race, writing about race and gender, mm -hmm. like in a, you know, so, but I noticed that like if I were a journalist or, you know, I wouldn't want to have had that constriction, whereas I think of it as like, well, I'm actually so much better at these bringing race and gender and class and sexuality in conversation with each other because I like view the world through that prism and I actually think I'm like really well trained at it. But I completely agree that if I were working at the times uh, it, that was my, you know I wouldn't want to be the one who only did that. But as someone coming outside, I'm like, oh, I can I think I do it really really well and I like you know like that's but so I don't have the same thing. But I understand. Or, or I was writing about um, Birth of a Nation and I was at one of those screenings with other people who are writing about it and this guy was like oh you just write about the black things and I was like yeah like I actually really feel good about writing about the but, but like he <laughs> thought I was like being like pigeonholed which I understood if mm -hmm. I yeah. had a different but I'm like yeah like that's fine like I, I mean I don't only write about the black things but that I think I was writing about <laughs> something else that I mean but African-American yeah. cultural because I'm like I would want someone like me yeah to write about if I were a, a, an artist who is marginalized or disenfranchised or whatever someone who gets gets it in a particular way who brings this kind of weight to it. But I understood why he was saying it, but I just didn't know how to respond because he was also very into the film. He had a lot of yeah. stuff going on. Look, <laughs> I'm just different. But, but I was like, oh yeah, I think he thinks I'm being pigeonholed. But that's, you know, it was an interesting moment. It's, it's tough. Like, I, I remember I was asked a couple of times to write um, a, a pieces for the Times Magazine for their first words column, which you know, is a column that takes a word and kind of explicates it. And, you know... If, I think I've only done it three times, but every word that I was either I was assigned, you know, because I was asked by the editor, would you be interested in weighing in on this? Had to do in some way with race. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the columns was about the term post-racial, which was I mean these are all like legitimately interesting things for me to talk about because I had to. It wasn't like I got the assignment; I just started writing. Like I had to do a lot of reading myself. Another one was on the concept of throwing shade, which is although we just read that piece in my class this afternoon. We were reading your work. Okay, yeah. But you know, it occurred to me that she was asking me to do. It felt like you know, pieces about maybe not racialized words, but that had to do with with race in some way. Um, and I didn't, you know, on the one hand, they were challenging to do, and I tore my hair out because actually I don't, I don't like writing very much. But um, on the other hand, and, so I, and I was flattered, but on the other hand, I was wondering, well, you know, would she have reached out to me if she wanted me to write a first words column on the word, I don't know, Republican? <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. So, um, I think like as a younger, um, or as someone who was doing internships where it was sort of like, oh, pitch whatever cool millennial idea you have or whatever, and like not too much, like I'm gonna task you with this like important story right now. Um, I would find myself choosing stories that had to do with people of color, queer people of color and things like that. Um, and then um, having to like insist upon like different wording or like using the term Latin X or something when talking about the Orlando massacre. Um, and it felt not very trivial, like it felt really important and also um, kind of uncomfortable to be having these dialogues with people that are your bosses. Um, and 
I think that's also an important conversation about like how to insist not only upon like your own humanity, but like other people's humanity in a professional setting um, when you're writing news, which is like objective. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I found it to be um, really interesting and striking about like how my identity like served in um, those like traditional news spaces um, and like what kind of like conversations I like dug myself into um, and things like that. Did you get pushback from people from bosses um, that was that was like defensive or it was just sort of like uh, this doesn't feel this is this term's confusing it's like not contributing much it's like our audience they they just want to know like the newsier part of the story um, and so like don't complicate things mm -hmm. um, so that and, would be like in reference to using Latinx oh yeah and that example. Mm -hmm. Um, or I also like wanted a main point of that article to be about like um, how the Latinx or Latino community, um, queer community is a community in and of itself. And like um, we can't just talk about Orlando as like um, LGBTQ and like need to acknowledge this like um, separate identity as well. Um, and just things like that that yeah. are sort of like this feels a little extra in the way that intersectional <laughs> feminism can sometimes just feel very specific. Um, and But it's just like you're sometimes just fighting for that specificity, you know? And you found yourself fighting for that specificity doing beat reporting, like doing the kind of reporting that we don't necessarily think of as making innovations in the kinds of language we use or staging an argument about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rebecca? Oh, sorry. Um, I feel like you had your hand up. You, you <laughs> had like a virtual hand sorry, up. No, I <laughs> thought the discussion was just very interesting, especially like um, I think everyone took turns talking about like the, uh, how like identity relates back to like journalistic work. But my question is actually like on the flip side of it, which is sometimes as news reporters, like it's difficult or it's you, you're not very sure if you're supposed to bring your identity into your work because the point of it is to be objective. Um, so I think in any journalistic class, people always learn like the Sabrina Erdely Rolling Stone incident. Um, and for that, I was I was thinking, you know, um, is it possible, you know, as a as a woman to be skeptical, as a female journalist, to be skeptical and empathetic at the same time? Like you want to come in with um, the empathy that you have for your source and then the empathy they have for the victim, but at the same time, you have to be incredibly skepti skeptical and to leave your biases at the door. So I've always wanted to ask, you know, people who have, like, writ like, written professionally, like, female journalists, like, how do you do that? Or, like, is this something you struggle with? That's a great question. It is yeah. a great question. I don't have a good answer for it because I don't, I, I don't struggle with it because I don't do that sort of reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, would, I would be lying if I said that I did. I, I think, you know, even with, like, m stories that I've done that are pretty minor in comparison to the one that you're mentioning, you know, you want to what would they say, trust but verify. Um, because I would, well, I'm well aware of the fact there's a whole cadre of people out there who are just waiting for um, women to mess, mess up or people of color to mess up and to use that as a, a weapon by which to delegitimize them or their work anyway. So I, I feel like women and people of color who are writers and journalists are under even more pressure to get it right. But we, yeah, we should, all, we should all try to get it right. Um, I'm a big believer in, in, in facts. I mean, with <laughs> not, not fake news. <laughs> but with regards to that piece, yeah, she, I, it's possible. I, I don't know what happened. I mean, I know I read many, many, many like postmortems on that piece, yeah. but I, I still don't really understand what happened there. Yeah. It, 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 other than that she took this young woman's word too seriously and didn't verify certain things. And, and I think did a lot of damage, not just to, I mean, I don't care about the damage done to Rolling Stone. It's more the damage done to the, to stories about sexual assault and and whether women should be believed, um, I, I think it was you know it was mortifying to, to watch that play out. But yeah, I don't personally have that struggle because I'm not doing those sorts of stories. Right. Um, so I think um, even though I don't do like similar reporting, I do think there are different moments when I choose to be part of the I, like the, uh, me, be part of the piece. Um, and not, so I'll give you two examples. So um, I have this month or March issue of Elle, it's on Solange, and I, it's my first time writing a profile cover story of it, 
and like the edit Lori uh, mm-hmm. Abrams because Rebecca you know blah 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 mm-hmm. we have all these people. um really wanted me I was like okay I like studied profiles I was like how do you write you know how, I'm gonna like, get the profile I'm gonna like, get it done and so <laughs> it was a profile it was like point A to point B to point C and it was Solange was great and blah 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 and then uh, the editor came back and she's a great brilliant editor and she was like I think I kind of want it like she suggested like it be profile and personal essay because like what that's what I could bring like I you can get another reporter to do right. like a profile about this <clears throat> character but or this figure but but so then it, so so that's an example of when I use the myself but I think of myself as a kind of a character in the piece too like it's not all of me that you're I'm sharing it's this particular part of me that fits into the story and fits into the argument or the 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 narrative that I'm trying to unfold for the reader. So that's like a decision you make, you know, you you include and they're personal pieces. Like there are parts of it like um talking about like her song Don't Touch My Hair and like my hair being t- like being at Penn and having my hair being t- you know, or um, my anxiety around my children who are both African American and what does it mean to live in a in a society in which, you know, black death is so common, right? So there are the ways in which I'm opening up, but I also choose only particular parts of me that fit fit in the story. And then with the Nate Parker piece or the Birth of a Nation piece for the um, the New York Times, yeah, you know, I was like so excited about this film because my first academic my academic book is on like contemporary representations of slavery. So I spent ten years like thinking about how do we represent slavery today? What does it mean? Blah blah blah. So I was like, oh I heard you know when Sundance with this film, I'm like, oh this is like ripe for Salamisha. Like I'm ready to go with this film. And then the story, you know, Changed. It literally like changed. I was like, I was like, wow. It hadn't seen the film yet. Everybody else had seen like these screeners, and I hadn't. And the story kind of devolved into the work, and, and and it fit with this other really big part of my identity as like an activist around sexual violence. So the question was, what does the piece become, right? And how much do I say that I'm a survivor in the piece? Do I not? Could it be a meditative essay? Should it not be? And so in the end, I actually wrote about. Um, with how the story of Nat Turner from like the first um, version of the story that we have when he was interviewed um, when he was imprisoned to like this novel that comes out um, by William Styron in the late 60s, early 70s to the uh, Birth of a Nation film, that rape is always like embedded in this text and that like the lives and the voices of those those women, black or white, are kind of sidelined in order for us to have like the sympathy for this 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 hero of, of Nat Turner. So then I was able to like not I didn't feel like it was useful for me to put my story in, even though that's like a big part of my identity. And I also didn't feel like it was necessarily for me to like come down on how we should think about Nate Parker. But it, it's obvious in the piece that like regardless of how, what we think of him, that this there's a way in which like our marginalization and violence against women becomes part of the Nat Turner story. And so it gives us another way of reading the film um, that I think um, complicates, even if you, you know. So so that was like an interesting choice because like maybe in another moment I would have been like da 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 da, but I was like, oh, I don't have to really use myself because I can actually just use the text <laughs> to do the work mm-hmm. that's shaped by my experience as a survivor, um, but that isn't foregrounded. Whereas in other pieces, I may use myself to because it helps the story move forward. So it's just a different, you make decisions about how, but it's not the same. So yeah, I think there's no you know objectivity, blah, 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 but also I think the I can be used in constructive and particular ways. So. I think we should take some questions from our audience. Oh, okay. And there is a microphone, and I would love it if you would speak into the microphone, not just so we can hear you a little bit better, but because we're recording the program. And it's great to have is this those. Live it is live oh, okay. streamed. Okay. Okay. We're being live streamed. Oh, okay. So who has a question for, I don't know if for our panel? Oh, okay. Maybe no one heard me at all. There are a lot of people. Oh, there's a question up here in the front, Mary. Up here. Yeah, Mary. So I was really interested in the... In, oh, oh, no. Hi. Thank you. My name is Ariella. This is really interesting, so thank you. I was really interested in um, the conversation about how feminist media has evolved um, over the past decade. And, you know, like maybe a week or two or so, like um, Jane Pratt, site that died and you know I was reading all the like hot takes about that and like what it was telling us about the death of like the way too revealing sort of exploitative female 
essay. And I'm, I'm interested to hear how you think sort of identity politics and the, the evolution of the digital landscape is shaping, um, is shaping the way we tell stories about our own victimization and like our own experience. And you kind of touched on that. And if you think that we're sort of getting better at it as a media culture. I think you should go first because you, you talked about this stuff in writing more than I have. So like, okay, let's make sure I get the question. So it was right, like, so has the media, new media platforms enabled us to tell our own stories better or more? In a way that's, I think, more productive, mm -hmm. or, or that you think is more productive, like, I don't want to define, but I think that there have been moments that have been kind of painful for people. Mm -hmm. Can you get, and is that the example that you gave at the beginning with like, the? Like, Exo Jane. Exo Jane. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. You know, yeah. Ten women craft to like yeah. tell their well, I guess, you know, what's interesting about my story with sexual assault is that my sister and I started, like, so I'm a sexual assault survivor. I went to Penn undergrad, and I was sexually assaulted my freshman year and my junior year study abroad, and um, I published my story for the first time as part of my own healing process in the feminist newspaper, Generation XX. And then my sister, who's a social documentary photographer, started documenting my healing. So it was really pre, like, selfie. It was like the early um, 2000s. And so I think I was able to find my voice around my particular trauma before this age. And so I think, you know, that's a, it's an interesting, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't know what it would be like to have um, my story on the internet as my un entry point into coming out or coming of age as a rape survivor, I actually think it would be radically different and much more unsafe um, for me, uh, as opposed to like, people really weren't like reading Generation XX like hardcore, like, you know what I mean? It was like, like a real specific <laughs> readership. Um, so yeah, I actually think it's, so even though I think it's productive, so on one hand I would say that the proliferation of stories um, that various media platforms are providing for in, th in this particular topic of sexual assault actually create like this, you know, there, it's, it's hard to imagine certain things. It's hard to imagine, well, we know that Bill Cosby's fate is radically different in this age than it was in the pre um, kind of social media age. So there's, so in one ways we have the kind of collective collection of voices and the, the collectivity that's risen. But at the same time, I think um, as a young person who's sharing um, his or her story of abuse, um, it's a really tricky terrain um, and not, as you point out, like safe or oftentimes one could be exploited or it's just a really, it's so different to kind of be, that be the way in which you share your story with the world because the, it's quite literally the world as opposed to, so I think I wouldn't have been able, I don't mean, I don't know what I would be like if I were like 20 now and would I do that? Maybe I would because it's so normalized and, um, and, and, and available, but I think my coming into my own voice around these issues was a very different, even though it was media oriented, it was a very different age. And so I think that made my disclosures possible in a different way. So yeah, it seems I, like, um, yeah. just to jump in here, because I think you're pointing to this idea that there's this proliferation, this generational proliferation that has pros and cons. But maybe one of the things we've lost is like the forms of media that we had before that turn 10 years ago, and maybe there were forms of media that made certain kinds of storytelling possible um, that yeah, now, yeah. now we get to reimagine. Well, I think people are still doing like chat books, and they're still doing it in their own way, but I think the online versions maybe are, are quite different than this. Anna? I, I haven't written that much about um, personal things that have happened to me. Uh, I mean, I think the most personal I've ever <laughs> gotten, I'd have to go look through my my list of writings probably is about the fact that I got pregnant multiple times when I was younger. Um, and I wrote that for a women's magazine. I didn't realize they were going to put it online, although I knew if they did that I was that that's when I was going to start getting yelled at because I didn't have I didn't have children. I terminated the pregnancies. Um, and, and then I think like an allusion to me getting divorced. But the, the, it, it isn't it isn't the internet that I think has made it da has made it more difficult for people to talk, to talk about their personal experiences without getting piled on in social media. Because the beginning couple years when we were 
Jezebel, I mean, the writers were, for the most part, not writing about their personal lives, although sometimes they would inject things in there. And sometimes they would want to write a whole essay about something that had happened to them. And, 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 you know, there might be commenters who would say, you know, vaguely mean things, but it was not like there were, there were not campaigns being directed at them on Twitter because Twitter wasn't really a thing. And, mm. and, and so there, it was actually, even though it was in the, on the open free internet, it was still a safe space, even though I hate that phrase, um, that, for, you know, through which they could operate. And I, I also didn't, um, encourage them too much to write about themselves because of the fact that I was well aware that young women were often encouraged to write about um, themselves in ways that they may later regret, uh, or, or that they were oftentimes rewarded for uh, exposing themselves in certain ways that could later hurt them professionally, whereas young men who were asked to do so were oftentimes rewarded for it. And there was no better example of that than the culture at Gawker Media, which was the company that owned Jezebel, because there was a young woman who wrote for Gawker.com, which is now, as everyone knows, no longer, who was always encouraged to write about her dating life and her sex life and yada, 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 and she was pilloried for it. I think it took a long time for her to move past that, whereas the young men who were there were, were rewarded for it by being given um, you know, editor-in-chief titles. <laughs> so I think, I think, I think that like it's. It, I think that the, the digital media has opened up a space for people to find one another and, and share common experiences that maybe had felt felt completely were, in, in ways where they felt completely alone before. With something like Exo Jane, that was like a that was a site that trafficked in, in in young women's personal revelations in a way that was very unseemly, and that and that um, I don't think was helpful to any really sort of dialogue. I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know, because the thing is, I don't read the internet the way I used to. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, have you guys seen that video? It's under this, like, hashtag hurt bay. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, you, yeah. You, oh, okay, no, what that's it is. not no, journalism. No. That's just... You mean, you mean the video that, like, the, the, some site the, the owned by Connie Nast did about the girl confronting her ex-boyfriend who yeah. cheated on her? Yeah. I, even I watched that. <laughs> um... <laughs> Will you yeah, tell that us what was it is, Taylor? horrible. I yeah. actually haven't seen it because I know, because I'm really upset about it. But um, yeah, it's like a couple, and well, you've seen it. Do you want to yeah. describe it? Um, I, I don't remember the name of the site because I think I, I came across it on Twitter. Or, yeah, I, came, I came across it on Twitter. It's a video where a young woman and the man she was once dating and perhaps perhaps lived with, or maybe they lived in the same apartment built apartment complex, is it, is confronting him as to why he cheated on her. Oh, I um, this, yeah. did you see it? Yeah, I think and, so. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. so painful to watch. Uh, I mean, it, for a lot of reasons that that they you know that some company set this up and like you know put them in a studio with nice lighting and and you know beautiful like beautifully filmed um, footage and, and and just watching this intimate moment between them that is totally staged, which isn't to say that they are faking their reactions to one another, but it's just, it's just heartbreaking to watch because he, he seems to be a sociopath. He like, doesn't have feelings. Um, and she's so, so hurt by what he's done. And it, it, it just felt very invasive. Um, but I clicked on it, you know, I think I clicked Even on though it. you read the internet differently than you used to. Well, I didn't, I didn't know exactly what it was. It was someone, someone, one of the people I follow on Twitter was, was, you know, exclaiming something about it, so I wanted to see what she was, you know, upset about, and then I, you know, once I started watching, I couldn't stop. So I'm part of the problem. And it's like I saw that because of a blavity commentary, um, like why monogamy is dead, commenting on that video. And so it's like even if people are, <laughs> it is dead. Um, even if people are like saying that something about this video wasn't okay. Um, they're still like going to draw more traffic there. Mm -hmm. And I felt so horrible for this girl who's like publicly or like globally humiliated at this point. Um, and people are still like generating conversation about it even if they wouldn't have posted that video themselves. Well, it's, the question is, do you think she was humiliated though? I think that she was humiliated by him and what he did to her. And I think that, I mean, as someone who's a little bit older and can look at, at the two of them and inter interacting, that in fact he should have been the one who came away humiliated publicly because he comes off so, so horribly. Just like, you know, without any 
emotion or anything. Um, and she really exposes exposes herself in a in a raw and real way. But I don't know if that means that she should feel humiliated. I think that she was used by the media company, but I don't know if she should be humiliated because she was very much her herself. It's it's, it's interesting. I, I don't I don't know what the answer is, but. What other questions? Do we, oh, there's a hand up here. Hi. Um, just by way of full disclosure, um, I'm Sabrina Erdely, the Rolling Stone writer you guys were discussing earlier. Um, the question that I have is, um, you know, it seems to me that this discussion is a has been a fairly downcast one. It's really talked more about the limitations and the perils of um, feminist and intersectional journalism. And I think I'm just a little surprised by that. And I want to ask you why, why you feel that way. Because to me, I feel as though, you know, reading the media and until recently being a longtime member of the media, um, it seems to me that there is a new hunger for people to write about race, for people to write about women's issues, and to write about all kinds of intersectional issues that there never has been in the mainstream media. So I actually feel like it's a very exciting time, um, full of opportunities. Um, and I don't know if that's because, in part, I, you know, I'm not on social media, so I'm looking at it more from a macro and not a micro way, but I wonder if, if any of you kind of share that feeling of enthusiasm or excitement for this time. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess, um, so I guess there's like the, the, not pessimistic side to me, but like, I guess I feel like the numbers may not necessarily be changing drastically in terms of like the diversity of journalists who are like, let's just use like the New York Times, the <laughs> bad example, but an example, like, cause you know, I write for them, but like maybe it's not a shift radically in like who the editor, what the editors look like, or maybe it's not like the number of journalists writing or I don't know. Like, I feel like on one hand there's like the need and the hunger and I think um, maybe ma mainstream organizations are, are catching up to that. Like, it's almost like there was like a delayed response between like, oh, we had this election. Oh, we should have been thinking about these things in an intersectional way. Some of us have been doing it, um, but not enough. So I guess that's the only like the pessimistic, <coughs> not, not pessimistic, but more like, um, because I think that other spaces were doing it, like the blogs and maybe like you're saying like Teen Vogue, which apparently is super radical, like everyone keeps on talking about it. Super, mm -hmm. like, and I'm like, oh, like I don't really read Teen Vogue, so yeah. I, but I believe that yeah. it's doing, and like, that's also like the editor, and the, there, like there's a shift in maybe how the organization, a deliberate shift in how the organization is branding itself, and the diversity of leadership. So I guess for me, like, is there, it's one thing to like, you know, there may be hiring freelance writers here and there, but then is there like a diversity in all, parts of the organization that reflect the hunger that um, that the audience or the readership um, may be having. So I guess that's that's the only thing that, but I do think, you know, the idea of like, it's so interesting because we call it intersectional feminism, like that's like so, like I mean, I, I think I, that's the term now. But well, I we guess, should probably just call it feminism now. Yeah, no, or there's like black, there's a whole long tradition of black feminist, tr you know, women of color, like so they've always been doing intersectional feminism but it's no it's it's nice that it's like a term I'm really excited about it it's, it's also like pointing to the fact that um, we've arrived at a new moment where like you know Kimberly Crenshaw came up with that so long ago so it's a moment now where that can be legible to audiences and readers and I think that's important so I think on one hand there's new voices there's new conversations I guess I just want that to be part of like the infrastructure more um, and maybe that's kind of like what's happening it seems to be happening slow, slower than the need for it to be happening. So that's kind of my response to, to that. So I would love to hear the students respond to that question because it, it, would you describe your own um, desire to enter the media profession as um, something that, like, is there a hunger there for you? Yeah, for sure. And I don't think it's just, um, like, at this point in time, it's also in this country. So I'm not from America. I'm from Singapore. And I can tell you that the kind of news coverage here in terms of uh, the kind of nu nuance and the kind of a complexity that it allows, especially in terms of gender issues, is definitely not seen in my home country and not seen in my home region, which is Southeast Asia. So I think it's an extremely exciting time to be um, in journalism in the US, actually. Um, but at the same time, I, I feel like this poses um, new and complicated 
challenges at working as a journalist because it means you necessarily, first of all, have to be educated in those complexities and those nuances to be able to really confront them and, and report on them um, diligently, which I think is difficult often. And um, I think oftentimes, like, journalists don't do like a super good job of it because you know like the job of a journalist is to like go into a room and un understand everything as quickly as they can but as the story becomes more and more complicated it, beca it takes more time and takes more energy to to really understand what's going on um i think my i'm personally very excited by all these different like avenues um where like um, outlets that weren't traditionally associated with like feminism um, are open to those stories um, and also to like queer stories. Um, but I think my main like reservation or like frustration right now is like all the buzzwords and like the very specific topics that are circled back to. And like I never would have thought that I'm sort of like done with talking about like my hair being revolutionary, you know? It's like it is, it's amazing, but like I like it's all the time, you know? <laughs> and like um I feel like there are certain topics that like because of how much I'm on social media, I just like it it's so important and yet I like feel nothing towards it now. Um and things like that. I, I wanted to answer um the question about I think you used the word downcast, which I, I would say I feel a little downcast about it. I think it might be in part because of the election. Um, uh, there was a time when I felt that the media was in a really exciting place with regards to conversations about gender and, and race and a lot, a lot of other things. And I don't think that it's, I don't think that the media has, has, has um, departed from those conversations. Although I think ultimately what has struck me is that the people who are in positions of power and media organizations continue to be um, mostly male, mostly white, that, that there may be more people who are getting a chance to, to speak in terms of sharing their voices, but the people who are making the actual decisions um, haven't changed much in, 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 the, in, the, in the ways that they look or, or, and sometimes even think. Um, I have a lot of friends who write about gender or race at various publications, and I hear a lot of stuff about you know, clueless things that their editors say. I think a lot of pe young people who are, in, who are working in media are not served well by their editors because their editors are so busy that they don't actually, um, they don't teach them the ropes in the ways that I would hope that they would be taught. So people make a lot of very public mistakes in a way that maybe you wouldn't, you know, 20 years ago when, you were, when it was just print and not digital. Um, and, and I think of it, I think part of it, part of my feeling a little downcast might have to do with my my concern that there's a certain commodification going on. Um, I think the moment that I started to feel kind of icky uh, ab about all this was um, when I don't know how many years ago this was, but when it, when Beyonce appeared on stage, maybe it was the Grammys with a big feminist sign behind her, which to me felt like marketing. That's what it felt like. It was. Yes, it was. It was. I wouldn't say it was revolutionary. She was on a she was on an award sh show stage, but it 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 it, it was it was sh shocking to me, and it was there was something kind of delightful about it, but there was also something that felt um, commercial about it that made me that gave me some pause. And like I think since that moment, um, I've felt a little conflicted about um, what I think is the commercialization of 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 gender politics on a very um, shallow level, um, which is just just you know call oneself a feminist. And I'm not accusing Beyonce of being shallow here, I'm, but I'm saying that was that was a moment in the culture when it felt like things that were brewing online um, burst into the mainstream, but in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. And now I want like I, mean, I wonder if we can so that like I think I read that moment similarly as well, um, and the like so with the MTV Music. Awards um, and uh, the Chimamanda, um, we should all be we should all be feminists. Like the, the clip that she uses from the, the TED talk. But then if I maybe I could obviously talk about the Knowles sisters. But um, <laughs> but I guess if we use Beyonce's own evolution, right? So there's that moment in which it's like kind of apex of like pop feminism and how do we read Beyonce's feminism? But then if we use that and then go from there, like what she did with feminism mm -hmm. to like lemonade, then it actually is like maybe 
a more optimistic turn, even if the, the moment she does it, we read it at the time as like commodification right. and there's all this stuff. And um, But we used to all do, what's the name of the book? We, we were all feminist once. Um, do you know the book that came out? She looks at the commodification. Yeah. Um, Andy's Eisler. Andy's Eisler. Yes, which yeah. I've read the book, but I'm bad with titles. Yeah. So she looks at, you know, yes. that's her book, and, and, she, and it's a really smart book, and she's looking yeah. at this 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 moment and in, in this this movement being um, you know and other people call it mercantile feminism with like um, Ivanka um, but I do think like Beyonce is actually an interesting phenomenon because her she does actually kind of play out and live out a more radical feminist politics as the albums are progressing so that's like a different you know she became I mean we could argue if we think of this as true but I do think she really has um, vocally and sonically and visually embodied a kind of a radical, or at least a progressive uh, black feminist politics that we didn't always associate with her, mm -hmm. and she consciously did so. So that moment's both like the moment that it's being quote, quote unquote commodified, but also for it's also like the turning point in her. Right. So that the both can coexist, and that's sure, like a sure. challenging yeah. thing for us. Yeah. But yeah, but I, I do feel downcast, and I think a lot of that's because Hillary Clinton <laughs> lost, and I think the yeah. way and, and the ways that she lost, and the things that were said mm -hmm. about her. Um, even if you weren't a, an enormous fan of hers, I mean, the New York Times, uh, you bring up the New York Times, and I write for them as well. If you look at their political reporting staff, I mean, I think there was, there's one person of color, a woman, who is, is very, very, very junior. Um, and, and that's, I think, malpractice of a sort in the 21st century, covering a campaign between the first female, the, or, Democratic nominee for for president and and uh, uh, an individual who made racism and xenophobia part of his um, campaign platform. So I do I yeah I think a lot of this has to do with the election, honestly, um, because it really did feel like it felt like the culture was going in a certain direction, and I'm not I'm not convinced that it's not, but it feels like right now we're all trying to take stock as to as to what's next. We have a, an amazing reception waiting for us, but I want to oh. make room for one more question, if there's one more eager question in the audience. Yes, we have one more. So to the, um, to the question about commodification, um, the perspective I'm coming from, I'm not really a, a writer. I've done some freelance fashion writing, but I'm primarily a fashion designer. Um, and I've really sought to inject fashion, which is like a fundamentally commercial thing, with politics, right? And it's expensive, which, you know, expensive things can only exist in capitalist societies, which are, you know, unequal, right? And that inequality is wrong. And I know that because I'm a political science major and, you know, all these sorts of things, right? But I guess, like, are there certain, are, are there certain sort of, like, types of journalism or types of writing or types of um, expression that cannot legitimately talk about certain things, right? Cannot legitimately speak about politics, cannot legitimately speak about feminism. And sort of where do we, if that's the case, you know, where's the line, right? Before it does become commodification or can glamor, right? Can L, can Essence, can Vogue, right? You know, during the campaign, Vogue hosted for the first time they endorsed Hillary Clinton as a candidate. They've never endorsed any candidate before. And they did a huge thing during New York Fashion Week in September, um, like a huge rally, fashion show, fundraiser for the Hillary Clinton campaign. So I recognize that there is sort of this tension that they are trying to sell really expensive bags to the wives <laughs> of hedge fund managers, right? Like, it, <laughs> truly, right? Like, if you look at the whole, you know, fashion system, who's buying $6,000 bags, right? But, you know, that's just the, the question I have. So are people ineligible to write about certain things? Is it, like, is it automatically illegitimate for like lesser forms of journalism? That, or is it automatically illegitimate for lesser forms to comment on serious issues? So, and how, yeah, if yeah. so, why? If not, how not? I actually not? think that's like a, not you're invoking, but the idea that women's magazines are inherently less apolitical or be less intellectual actually is like something... I mean, there's some, like in any industry, there are magazines that are maybe more, um, they're, they're, you know, the New Yorker is seen as a particular type of readership, the Atlantic is seen as having a particular type of readership. 
but the women's magazines, I think, you know, are often seen because they're catering to women or they're fashion oriented, that they're not as like intellectually, and they are selling. I think they're all selling something. All these magazines are selling something, but maybe one scene is selling ideas and goods, as another one may be seen as selling objects and then ideas. So I guess I want to push back on the idea that women's magazines are inherently less political um, and less um, uh, rigorous or intellectual. I think, you know, uh, I'm not an avid magazine person, a reader, so that maybe, you know, if we can debate this more. But um, yeah, I guess I think that's just like a false construct. So I just want to say that. Um, I mean, it, I, would, I don't think that's really my construct. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna put. No, I'm not saying you're saying it. That's I think what's. I think that's. Yeah, like I think you're obviously a fashion, so you wouldn't hope that was how we think of these magazines. But I think that's out there. And I guess I heard this recently from an editor, and she was saying like, uh, women's magazines aren't taken as seriously as. They, and I was like, oh, that's so weird because, I look at these. I, I think they all have like these cultural biases. They all have like these problematic um, things. And I'm not in that industry, like in it, in it to know like what the hierarchy is. But it's, it's it is fascinating to me that like women stuff is is consistently seen as lesser um and and i feel like there are certain magazines like i guess vogue is, is one but l really like rebecca Sno like the same issue it's like all these things but like fun, like really smart interesting essays um that if i were a more avid magazine reader i would be able to appreciate but so i don't know i'm just i'm not really saying anything deep other than i feel like there's like a binary um and that women um in the industry these magazines are seen as less than when in fact they may be like Teen Vogue, like at the forefront, right? Um, in some ways, or when men write about politics, um, or The Atlantic, like with Tanahasi, who's brilliantly writing about these things, that's serious. But when someone does it in another form, it's not serious. I think I just want to complicate that. I, I think women's magazines are historically, or at least in the, in the '90s and in the early aughts, were worse than men's magazines. And I thought that they, and, and in fact, we spent many years, like ripping them to shreds. Um, because of the fact, because of, because of the ways in which they sold um, and packaged women's insecurities in order to get them to buy more more things in a way that men's magazines didn't. Now, I'm not saying that that's the fault of the magazine editors. It could be the fault of the publisher. Or there, there's there's lots of interconnected things, and I think that women's magazines became better when the feminist internet forced them to be better. So I think that they're much better now than they were before. But um, it, it, the question is, is it illegitimate for, can you rephrase it, or can you phrase it again? Is, is it illegitimate for certain types of journalism to, to touch on certain things? Well, it sounded like your question is, is there a form of, is there a form of more quote unquote commercial feminism or, or commercial political thinking that's not necessarily pure commodification? Like how do you draw, like how do you, when you say that, this is really in response to your comment earlier about the commodification, right? Like. They're selling, you know, lipsticks and handbags and dresses and whatever. I just think, like, I, I definitely agree that there is, there needs to be some. I just think there needs to be like more nuance, or maybe there, like, does need to be more nuance in understanding, like, is it possible for these things, which are very purely commercial, to say something more, and how do we? Okay, yeah, you know. no. So I guess I think Essence is a good model. I mean, and mm -hmm. unlike the other women's magazines, at least in the 70s, it had a, like, it was like trying to have like a radical politics, saw beauty um, as a political category. Um, and, and so I think, you know, it has another history now, but I do think there are that, like, if we go back to those early issues um, um, in that, that kind of long decade, um, we can see that there were grappling with. Maybe the idea wasn't commodification, but how can you have like, how can you have like makeup, which I don't think is apolitical, but you can have makeup alongside handbags, alongside like questions around um, what does it mean to be a black woman, what does it mean to be part of a black family. I mean, there, that's a, actually a really useful um, magazine that kind of was doing that in a way that was different than like Ebony and, and Jet. Um, it's other contemporaries. So, um, yeah, so I would yeah. use go back old school and go to like Essence in the 70s as maybe a way of reimagining that kind of relationship between the commercial and the political. And maybe magazines now are trying to, I don't know, I don't want to say Glamour in the, in the 80s when I was a teenager, I, I guess I subscribed to it. I don't remember why, because it was, I knew it was for like adults, not, not teen girls. But it, it, was, <laughs> it, it felt very political at the time. And it was, I think, had a rep, not that I knew this, but if you look back at things written about it from that era, it was, it was very political. And they became cosmified by um, 
an editor who worked at Cosmo who then went on to Glamour, and I worked there. I mean, so I, part of my part of my like feeling like grumpy about women's magazines in the aughts is because I've worked for a lot of them, um, and 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 they were they were not they were not um, for the most part asking any any sort of intellectual rigor out of their writers, editors, or or audience because that was just that was just the era. That's not to excuse it, but. Um, it's interesting to me because I, I do think that that a magazine like Vogue can talk about politics in a way that feels <laughs> legitimate as long as they're kind of self-aware about, as long as there's some, there's some sort of self-awareness there. It may not be about politi- you know, about electoral politics, but, but let's be very clear, like Vogue is a magazine that's created uh, to sell things to the wives of help, you know, hedge fund managers, um, or, or at least to put forth a lifestyle that is totally inaccessible to 99% of the of the country if, if not the world and and th- that for them to have some self awareness about that to kind of maybe tweak tweak themselves once in a while would be a, at least for me a way to, for me to trust them and take them more seriously with regards to politics that they were aware of the ways in which they did uh, traffic in and engage in um, putting forth conventional ideas about Femininity and, and that it's mostly skinny, white, young, etc. Um, yeah, if they if they showed more self awareness in that way, then I think I would trust them more with regards to politics. But I think you know even Vogue has gotten better. Like they never had women of color on the cover ever. They had Oprah and they had maybe a Michelle Obama in the in the beginning of Obama's term. And now they're they're like if you look at the covers, they've changed a lot. So I'm not sure where I'm going with that, other than to say that I think there there, there needs to be some more self awareness among publications when they talk about. Politics, especially if they're coming from a place that didn't historically talk about politics. I want to thank Anna and Salamisha and Taylor and Rebecca for joining us tonight. I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, please check out the books table and please join us in the dining room for a reception. Thanks for coming. Thank you.